All right, we have a few more people just joining us here. Uh, Kaisha, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Kylie. If you don't know who I am, I'm the education specialist at the Bass Museum. I organize these wonderful presentations. Uh, tonight we have a presentation from Nancy Subiri about Bass in California. But um, before we get going, I'm just gonna talk about some kind of other stuff in the museum as everyone's joining us here. Um, Still have a few more people joining. Uh, so I have right now the Bass Museum uh, webpage opened up and um, you know I just like to throw this out there if you like what we're doing if you like these presentations go ahead and check it out. Um, if you go to visit and our events calendar just there uh, it'll show you other presentations that we have coming up and what we've done in the past. And then if you like these presentations, you know, we always do these for, or almost always do these for free, but um, we always appreciate your support. So if you ever feel like it and you like what you see and you'd like to support the museum, feel free to go to support over here. We have memberships um, and donations and we always appreciate, uh, you know, anything that, you know, helps us support doing more presentations like these. So it's by no means required, but I like to just kind of throw it out there for people. Um, so that was my shameless plug before we get going. And then I'm going to pass it right over to Annie Gavika as we still have some people joining. So we're going to give it just a minute before we get started. So sure. I'm going to stop Hi, sharing everyone. my screen and pass it on. <laughs> Hi, I just, um, I have a couple things. One, we want to again, thank you all for uh, being part of this. We're pretty excited about this exhibit and all of the work that has gone into it. Um, couple things on uh, housekeeping, just keep your mute on and your video off. And then if you're unfamiliar with um, Zoom, we are going to have a little chat box. If you wiggle your mouse over the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat box, you can click on that. And if you guys have any questions and Nancy's gonna ask some questions for you to at, put in um, answers into that chat, we will answer those questions as we go. And if Kylie or I can't answer them as Nancy's presenting, then we will have her answer them at the end. So just a couple quick things. A um, Couple other things I wanted to talk about is kind of why the Basque Museum in Boise, Idaho is doing a presentation and exhibit on Basques in California. <laughs> but so a couple quick things for us and maybe Nancy will have some to add to this, but in our opinion, kind of Basque is Basque. And so if we have the opportunity to share Basque American culture, um, we are gonna jump on it. And we were given that opportunity. So we're really excited. Um, and we learned a lot while we were doing this. Um, it's the museum's job to share Basque culture. So we um, have the staff and the contractors that were willing to do it. Um, but we were by no means the workers, the main workers of this whole project. There were so many people before it ended up with us. Um, we were just kind of the filter at the end before getting it to, out to the public. Um, and, and with that, I kind of want to add some thank yous to all the people involved in this um, leading up to our project, which the exhibit opened in October in 2019, um, which seems like forever ago now, uh, in Bilbao at the Basque Museum there in conjunction with Basque World Congress. So it's been a work in progress for years prior to that. Um, it's based mostly on Ashun Garicano's books, Cali California Coac and Far West Basque Country. Um, that's kind of the basis of this whole project. And then we had some wonderful researchers, authors, journalists, Steve Bass um, with uh, Basques of Kern County, Anthony Subidi in her travel guide to Basque America, of course, Bill Douglas at University of Nevada, Reno, Jeronima at Chivaria. Um, Nabo played a huge part in this, not only as an organization, but the organizations in California that are part of Nabo helped out quite a bit um, with all of their just prior research and their projects that they've worked on historically. Probably many of you on this presentation today have played a part in some way, shape, or form. Um, so we're really excited to kind of share this history that's nearly 500 years old of Basque history and immigration into the California area. And um, our 
one little last plug is this exhibit is at the Basque Museum and Cultural Center in Boise. Um, we also have a website for it. It's basquesincalifornia.eus. Um, we'll share that to you with you guys as well because it has so much information on this that we couldn't fit it all in one exhibit. So all the extra extra information is all on our website. And finally, if any of your organizations or um, cultural centers or even um, historical societies are interested in hosting this exhibit, we can make that happen. It is a great, super um, mobile exhibit that we can send out to so many people, so many places. Um, this will be up in Boise for at least the year. Uh, so hopefully you'll all be able to come up perhaps for High Aldi uh, 2021 and check it out. And with all of those things, I would like to now uh, give it over to Nancy Subidi so that she can give us her take on the Basques in California. So thank you, Nancy. Hi there. Welcome, everyone. Um, wanted to say hello. I, I saw the uh, list of participants. I see a few people I know. I saw Noel and Nicole and a few other people that um, were in the San Francisco dance group with me when I was part of that. So um, happy to see so many of you from the San Francisco Bay Area because this is um, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm going to tell you about how uh, unique the best community of San Francisco is. And I'm also going to talk about um, the best cultural center. And uh, it's just a magnificent building with a popular restaurant, a banquet hall, and a professional handball court. So I'm going to be talking about that uh, as a place that unites not just the Basques in the San Francisco Bay Area, but also the larger Basque community of California. So what is uh, my background and what qualifies me to talk about it? Well, uh, first of all, I'm a journalist and I have been um, I've written for um, a few California newspapers. I also was a high school teacher for many years, and I'm currently the editor of Euskal Caseta, which is a website about the U.S. Basque community. And of course, I'm the author of Travel Guide to Basque America. I grew up in San Francisco and danced with a few of you and uh, in the San Francisco Basque Club. And I currently live in Los Angeles. My father was from the Basque country, from a tiny town called Ishnasu in the province of Bashin Afarwa. So um, we're, I'm going to move on and uh, share my screen at this time. So um, I've got a slideshow that I presented uh, at the BEO Cultural Day back in October. So it's essentially the, a little bit different, but essentially the same um, presentation. And I'm going to share my screen and I'll be uh, talking you through the uh, slides as we go. Did anybody have a comment or want to ask a question before I get started? before I start sharing my screen with you. Okay. All right, so, oh, actually I need to go back a little bit. Darn. All right. I need to start from the beginning. Okay, all right, so uh, here we are. I did want to give a little bit of an overview of the Basques in California since um, this is um, part of that exhibit and uh, some of you may not know much about the Basques in California at all. So we're going to start with that. Um, well, how long have the Basques been in California? There have been, there were Basques involved in every one of these eras, uh, starting with the European exploration, which was done mostly by ship, 
and probably the, mo the most well-known Basque of that era was Sebastian Vizcaino, who um, went up the coast of California and actually mapped the coast and uh, named a lot of the uh, locations that continue uh, with those names today. Then we have the Spanish colonial period, which was mostly marked by the building of the California missions by the Franciscan friars. And while Father Junipero Serra is mostly credited with that um, endeavor, uh, a Basque friar, Fermin Lasuen, uh, led the, the building of almost half of the California missions. So that's surprising to some people. And then we had the Mexican era, um, about 30 years, in which uh, a couple of the governors um, were Basque, and it was known as Alta California at the time that it was under Mexican rule. And there was also uh, several land grants given by the Mexican government to Basques um, and who developed them um, they were known as the ranchos. So, um, but still very few people, in, in fact, very few people in California, uh, with the exception, of course, the Native American population that was already here before um, the Europeans and the Mexicans came in. Um, then we uh, moved to, of course, the gold rush which is when the majority of the immigration to California started. And um, Basque, Basques were just like everybody else. They were interested in finding gold. Uh, the first ones came up from Latin America, especially Chile, Uruguay, Argentina, Mexico, because they were on the West Coast and it was a very quick uh, trip. They caught ships and they came up. Uh, they, some of them stopped in Los Angeles, but others came further north to uh, San Francisco because they were interested in the gold. They came for gold, but um, ranching was more profitable. So those early bass settlers got involved in sheep and cattle ranching businesses in the central San Joaquin Valley. Uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco were the oldest Basque towns. We had little clusters of boarding houses in small neighborhoods within San Francisco and Los Angeles. The Basques called them hotels, even though they weren't hotels, they were boarding houses where they would rent a room and they would eat their meals in the main dining room and the, um, the hotels were run by usually a couple, a Basque couple. Um, there were hotels in other smaller communities, but much fewer of them. So Los Angeles and San Francisco, just like today, were, were the main um, communities in California where the Basques also congregated. What was the difference between these two? Well, Los Angeles um, had a bigger population. Um, it was a larger Basque community. San Francisco had one hotel uh, that opened in 1866 and then no other hotels until the 1890s. But Los Angeles's community uh, basic essentially disappeared fairly quickly. By the 1940s, most of the Basque had left the downtown community and spread out to different uh, communities around Los Angeles. And eventually all the hotels were torn down and replaced by high rises. There's nothing left of that um, Basque community. And now the closest concentration of Basques in the Los Angeles area are in Chino, which is a good 35 miles away. So nothing is left of that original uh, community. Whereas San Francisco was very different. They did have the fire that started from the 1906 earthquake that burned down the Basque neighborhood, but they did rebuild all those hotels just like everyone rebuilt. And those hotels in San Francisco existed for many, many years. Uh, some of the hotels that later turned into restaurants were open through the 1990s. And many of those buildings are still in existence. You can go 
to that neighborhood and see where uh, some of those hotels and restaurants were located. Okay, who was the first well-known Basque in San Francisco and how did he earn a living? Well, he delivered water from a local spring and he brought it to residents by mule. Um, his, oh, I found his obituary in, the, in a San Francisco newspaper, Juan Miguel Aguirre. He was one of those who came up uh, by ship from Uruguay. He was from the Basque country, from Echalar, but had first immigrated to Uruguay and then caught, caught a ship up the coast after uh, he heard about the gold rush. So he is noted in, in the newspaper, he was noted for starting the first waterworks in San Francisco. He also opened the first bass boarding house on Powell Street. He built the first handball court on Post Street and he was considered a leader of this early bass community. Here is a picture of one of, one of the very first hotels, the Hotel Vasco. Um, they had two handball courts and the earliest marriage at the French Catholic Church, Notre Dame de Victoire, was Basque. I'm going to show you some evidence of that later. Uh, and then some Basques, probably Spanish Basques, married at Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, which was the Spanish church. And Aguirre is noted as one of the founders. And this church is also located on Broadway, where some of the other hotels were. So the 1906 earthquake, uh, which resulted in uh, several fires, um, burned down those two first Basque hotels, Aguirre's and the Hotel Vasco. All right, did we have a, a question? Okay, here is a, a photo that I took. I went to uh, visit. Notre Dame de Victoire, their offices last summer, and uh, met with Father Cifer, who's been there a very, very long time and is well versed on the history of the church. Um, this is the marriage record of the first couple there from 1856. You can see the year and the names of the couple there in the left hand column. Uh, Bonaventure, Dolegui, and Gracieuse, Oyamburu. And then below there, you can see those fancy signatures. You can see Juan Miguel Aguirre. Um, so he was called upon by the Basque couple to be a witness for their wedding. Um, one of the stories that Father Cifer told me was that the Bush Street, those of you who are familiar with that church, you know it's on a hill. And so the priests were able, because they were up on a hill, they were able to see the fires approaching. And they thought they had the foresight to take the church records and bury them in the garden of the church. And that is why these um, records from before the 1906 earthquake are still available because they were smart enough to um, save them because a lot of city records um, were, were burned um, during those fires. Okay, San Francisco. Well, many of you have probably um, been there uh, or are from there, so you know it was a major point of entry to California and to the West, even before the Transcontinental Rail Railway opened in 1869. It was a regional cultural center and a job center. It was a vacation spot for uh, Basques who lived in the valley, uh, where it was super hot in the summer. Uh, and also sheep herders who were done with sheep herding and wanted to make a switch um, get a city job, would come and stay at some of the hotels. All right, let's see. There we go. All right, what were some of the jobs that they took? Well, they were gardeners. That was one of the most popular jobs. They had their own gardening businesses. 
They worked as janitors. They were laundry owners and workers. They were bakers. Some of them had uh, their own bakeries. Uh, they were cooks. They were restaurant owners, restaurant workers, hotel owners, hotel workers. They belonged to some of these French and Spanish cultural organizations, Ligue Henri IV, Les Jardiniers, Union Española. Um, many of them sent their kids to Catholic schools. Okay, and then handball. Uh, San Francisco always had a handball court. In the 1860s, we know that there were at least two. And later, we know about La Cancha. And um, I'm, I believe I was told this photo probably dates back to 1917. Um, on Powell Street, this area is now Chinatown. And this hotel, this boarding house, was very similar to the, the fronton in Boise in that the rooms were located around the handball court. The handball court was the most important part of the boarding house. Um, I have an interesting story to tell about this, uh, this boarding house. Uh, if you can see over on the right, there is a couple and the woman has a baby in her lap. And those were the owners of the boarding house, the handball, it was called La Cancha, it was just known as La Cancha. And that was the Mabe family. So when I was doing research for my book, Travel Guide to Basque America, I wanted to find somebody who was connected to this um, handball court, even though it, it already didn't exist at the time. And I was led to the woman who is actually that baby sitting on that woman's lap. Her name uh, was Juanita Meabe. And when I got in touch with her, and of course, you know, um, these older Basques, when you call them up, they want to know who you are and who you know and so on. And so she asked me, she was like, Subidi? I knew a Subidi. Um, and it turns out that the Subiti that she knew was my father. And he had gone to her family's hotel when he first arrived in San Francisco the very first time. And later on, they sold their hotel and my father lost touch with their family. They moved to Oakland, which wasn't very far away, but I guess in those days it was seemed far away. They lost touch. And even though I grew up in San Francisco, I never knew this family growing up. And it wasn't until after, um, after my father had passed away and that I got in touch with her and she was just so excited. We, we both were excited to have made the connection. And um, she and I stayed friends for quite a few years after this. She gave me this photo and she gave me a couple other photos that I'm gonna show you. So that was um, a real special treat that um, I ran across when I was doing the research for my book. Here we have Broadway. Now, uh, those of you who are from the San Francisco area, you know this street. It's a, it's, I mean, it's an exciting part of town. Um, no wonder the, hotels and restaurants did so well in this area. It was the, the heart, this was the heart of the San Francisco Basque community. There were hotels, there were restaurants. Um, to the north is North, north Beach, uh, the Italian neighborhood. Um, on the other side is Chinatown. It's a meeting of many different cultures and neighborhoods. Um, the Church Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, you can see if you look up the hill at, towards the top, you can see the top of the church tower there. So um, it's no wonder that this neighborhood and many of the buildings still remain to this day because there was a lot of stuff going on there. This is the Hotel des Alpes. Um, this hotel, well, there's a record of a Des Alpes hotel in 1904. It probably got burned down, but then was rebuilt. And this was um, Basque restaurant 
all the way at, as late as 1998. All right, how did the hotels turn into restaurants? Well, a lot of the former residents with their families would go visit the boarding houses on the weekends. And I wonder if any of you um, might have enjoyed that experience. I know that my family did. That's my mom there on the right with uh, Amelie Sorrondo of the Pyrenees Hotel where my father lived. And I'd, be, I'd love to hear from some of you if you ever went to um, weekend dinners at some of these um, boarding houses and enjoyed those meals with the, the food that never stopped, the huge plates. Um, some of the owners of these hotels got the idea to turn them into restaurants. I mean, it made sense. And that's how family style meals that made the Basque restaurants famous got started. These are a few uh, here, this list of a few of the ones that the better known ones in San Francisco. All right, here's another photo that uh, Juanita Meabe gave me. This is the outside of La Cancha. And uh, we've got two bala players there ready, ready to play. Uh, this was the front of the boarding house. So what happened in 1958? Well, the city decided they needed to build um, apartments for the Chinese immigrants for, because Chinatown was so crowded. So they basically bought up a section of the block from Broadway to Pacific. Um, when I spoke to Leon Sorondo, who um, the, the son of the owner of the Pyrenees Hotel, he told me that back then, well, that was, you know, the Basques just accepted that that's the way things were. They didn't argue. The government told them that they were going to buy their buildings. And so they, you know, they accepted the payment and that that's when several hotels and the handball court were torn down. So it was quite a blow to the Basque community uh, at that time. Okay, here we have Machin and Salvador, two very well-known Basque uh, Bertzolaris. And they were invited by some young Basques to sing at uh, a picnic of Les Jardiniers. And some time during their presentation, singing the, the Basque Bertos, the organizers who, uh, who probably didn't understand a thing got tired of the singing and pulled the plug. And this is part of the history of the San Francisco Basque community. The Basques who were at that picnic got very angry. And they, that, then and there, they decided they were going to form their own club. So that very same night, they went to the Hotel de France, uh, which was owned by the Basque Claude Berwet. And this group, um, along with the two singers, met at the restaurant to discuss starting a club. And the idea for the San Francisco Basque Club was born. But again, we have the issue of handball. Um, there was no handball court. So uh, they would drive to Stockton, which was an hour and a half away. There had been a Basque community there with several boarding houses and one of them had a handball court. So they went there, they cleaned it up and they would drive one and a half, half hours on the weekends uh, there and then back just to play handball. That that handball court also was torn down in 1966. And then we moved to this one that's here in the, in the photo that maybe those of you from San Francisco recognize, the Helen Wills Playground. The Basques went to the city and convinced them to build up, let them build up the front wall there. So it resembles the fronton walls in the Basque country. And um, from 1971 to 1979, Basque families often came uh, specifically on Sunday mornings to watch the guys play handball. I'm sure some of you remember that experience. 
All right. Well, we have, uh, just like everybody else, moved to the suburbs. The Basques moved to the suburbs as well. Um, in the South Bay, we had a lot of Basques moving to Redwood City, Burlingame, Millbrae, South San Francisco. In the North Bay, we had San Rafael, Novato, Petaluma, Sonoma, Santa Rosa, among others. I mean, the Basques now are all spread out. Um, the ones in the South Bay started a club, the Menlo Park Saspiak Bat Club for a few years. Eventually it dissolved and merged with the Basque Cultural Center. Later on, the Marin Sonoma Basque Association started in 89 and they're still active and still have a picnic every year. All right, but the Basques wanted their own place. They were frustrated. They didn't have a place to play handball. And even when they could play against the wall at Helen Wills, they didn't have a place where they could get together afterwards to play moose. Uh, the clica practiced at the Unión Española, but people would complain about how loud they were and they didn't have a place for dance practice. So. Uh, frustration was growing. It seemed like the timing was pushing the Basques to do something. So they took um, several steps in an effort to find a place. Um, they started talking about it in 1962. Um, the city of San Francisco offered them a city block for $30,000, which is amazing now if you think about it, and they turned it down. That spot later became Japantown. Uh, they bought a property in Los Gatos, which is uh, much further south. The neighbors weren't supportive and some of some Bass thought it was too far away from San Francisco. So they later sold that property. They looked at a clubhouse in Novato, but it didn't have room for a handball court. So they were definitely active uh, over the years looking for something. Um, some of the club members were against the idea. They just didn't want to take on that financial risk. It was uh, scary to them. What if it didn't do well? So they got some legal advice and a lawyer told them that um, the bylaws of the club prevented um, building something if, even if one person disagreed. So they realized that they had to create a separate organization. That's when they created a corporation to build the Bass Cultural Center. Um, and I heard this story from Francois Bidaureta, who was president of the San Francisco Bass Club at the time. He told, after the meeting was over, he told them he was going to talk about something that had nothing to do with the club, so that anyone who didn't want to be a part of it could leave. But when they heard that, of course, nobody left. So they decided to create their corporation and build the cultural center. They bought a, an acre and a half in South San Francisco and they reached out to the Basque community. They told people if they gave a thousand dollars, they would automatically become members of the cultural center. So money started coming in. Everything, all the money ended up coming directly from the Basque community. Uh, some people gave uh, larger loans and everything was paid back. Uh, at least over 150 Basques helped out during the 12 months it took them to build it. Um, many of them had their own businesses. They were gardeners and so on, so they could take time off if they wanted to. We had two Basque contractors, uh, Jean Gorostiag and Jean Jaurech who oversaw the construction. Um, other Basques were involved in construction. They were able to get um, discounts for materials and supplies. So it was really uh, the Basque community came together to build the cultural center. Here's some photos of when it was being built and uh, you can see the wall there. They got some professional advice on that wall because they wanted uh, a wall that would be supportive of Hyalai. The idea initially was that Hyalai could be played there. 
All right, and here is the handball court today. This is a recent celebration, um, 2017, and it recalls that other photo that I showed to you at the very beginning um, in which another party was held in the handball court. And I'm sure a few of you have been to a party in a handball court as well. Um, makes a great, great place for a lot of people. Um, the center was uh, the donations and the loans, the money just kept coming in. So they decided to expand the center. They added uh, meeting rooms, they added a banquet hall, they made the kitchen bigger, they made the restaurant larger. They were um, even surprised themselves at how much uh, money people were willing to donate and offer for the building of the center. Here is the inauguration, 1982, that magnificent building. Uh, so here we have the restaurant. The restaurant is extremely popular. Uh, if you look on Yelp, it's got very high ratings. People love it. Um, and this restaurant is key to the success of the center because it means that there is staff on location every day. Um, it allows the members to use the center every day because there's always staff there. And it also exposes the Basque culture to the public because people who aren't Basque are coming in there to enjoy the restaurant. There's only two other Basque clubhouses in California. There's one in Chino and another in Bakersfield. And those are only open uh, during Basque events. I mean, they do rent those out also, but um, not really open to the public except during Basque events, whereas the cultural center is open all the time. It, Except now, of course, uh, things are a little bit different, but All right, so the best the cultural center is thriving. They have two huge celebrations every year in February and in August. Uh, they'll serve 800 900 people in that um, handball court. The restaurant popular, the hall is rented out, the handball court, there's lots of competitions and celebrations, and the center is used by a lot of uh, Basque groups, and um, that's how we maintain the culture. All right, and I have some suggestions here for how to um, maintain the Basque culture, because uh, we know the longer as the immigrant generation um, disappears, it's up to the second and third generation to keep up the culture. And um, you have to do, you know, you have to get together, uh, attend festivals, bring your friends and your family to the festivals, um, join your closest bass club, help out. Sign your children up for bass dancing, learn how to play moose and join some of those moose tournaments or eat at the Basque restaurants. So uh, we need to, it's up to us now to keep up the culture. So um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I'm open. In right now for any questions. Um, we'd also like to know where some of you are joining us from. Uh, maybe you can uh, type it in the chat or maybe someone has a question for me. Oh, I see some people. I see someone from Richmond, Virginia. That's great. Vacaville, San Juan Capistrano. Excellent. Wow. All right, San Antonio, Texas. Impressive, love it. All right, Rockland, Santa Rosa, beautiful. Long Beach.
All right. And did we hear from anyone who um, anyone who ate at any of those restaurants that I mentioned during my presentation? Okay, great. Do we have anyone who wants to ask a question? Oh, nice. Oh, great. Good to hear, Yvette. Yeah. Good, I'm glad you, you learned something. Yeah. That's um, a history that unfortunately our, our children won't be able to experience. So we have to uh, remember and tell them stories about those days when we went to the fast boarding houses and ate those huge meals. And All right, Kylie, did we want to uh, open up or allow people to turn on their microphones in case they want to ask a question? Yeah, absolutely, I can do that. Um, I think I somewhere made it so they cannot, so let me fix that really quick. Um, yeah, so they can, you can unmute yourself now, I believe, if you would like to um, ask a question to Nancy directly. I'll give that a couple minutes and then um, here at the very end when we're all done, we got just a couple uh, extra little things to share with everybody from the museum. But if you have a burning question for Nancy, now is oh definitely gosh. your chance. So um, yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself and do a quick introduction and ask your question. <laughs> Anyone have a question? Or anybody want to tell us their experiences at some of the old Vasco hotels? Hi, can you talk about any influential Basques in Los Angeles at the turn? Ah, uh, well, that would probably involve be a lengthy discussion. Um, there's Miguel Leonis, who was um, maybe didn't. Uh, he, he had a large uh, ranch and um, maybe didn't have the best reputation, but was definitely very famous and his uh, ranch is still in existence and you can go and visit it. Miguel Leonis, um, the Leonis Adobe is one at least. All right, somebody has a question said how many people on uh, how many people speak Basque? All right, well, that's a good question. I actually don't speak Basque. Uh, my mother was from Peru. And so my parents spoke Spanish at home. So hablo espanol, uh, je parle francais. And um, I was able to get along with pretty much every Basque with one of those languages, with Spanish or French or English. Um, although learning to speak Basque is on my bucket list, I still would like to learn, learn it. Anyone else here uh, speak Basque or learn it at home with their parents? All right, Joe, Basque was your first language. Excellent. Um, I'll just put a mention in there really quick since we're talking about that and the Basque language. Um, the Basque Museum does offer language classes and of course this year um, in the world of COVID and social distancing uh, all of our classes are going to be offered online so if it's something you've been thinking about but maybe you live in an area either without a Basque club or they're not offering Basque classes um, whatever the case may be, uh, this is your year because really anybody can join from anywhere and, and do classes. Um, all that information is up on our website uh, under the learn tab there. Uh, but yeah, we had about 45, 50 people in our Basque classes last year. So it's certainly picking up around here anyways in Boise. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, send us an email, check out our website because uh, there's more and more resources being added all the time for that. And um, we're happy to share that information with you and get you hooked up with either a teacher in your area or through us either way. 
it'll all be on zoom and it's actually going to be really fun i've seen how they got it set up and it's you can do it don't be intimidated it'll be it'll be great this year <laughs> okay all right that's good to know maybe this is our the, maybe this is the time to do that now that we're uh you know more spending more time at home and on our computers um all right did somebody hey, hey, yeah, this, is, this is noel go ahead how are you good you know, good first First off, I'd like to say thank you uh, to you for putting on this presentation for all of us, and then also to Kylie uh, Bermansola and Andy Garbica uh, for hosting this on uh, for, for all of us out here in California. Great. Really, really enjoyed the whole thing. So, you know, your your presentation for me personally, I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember those days at Helen Park and the Dissolves Obrero. Um, and the Basque Hotel in Broadway. And um, I always remember as a child driving through Broadway to get to the handball court, uh, we had to put our heads down and not look <laughs> sides. So that was the rule with my dad. And uh, he would check to make sure we were doing that. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, you know, the, the everything that went on, you know, I speak Basque, right? Uh, was raised in a household where we had to speak Basque. And I say had to because my dad was very um, strict when it came to that right and whereas her mom was a little more lenient and she liked to speak english so um that's the way that was but uh, at the time you know uh, growing up basque you know um didn't know how fortunate we really were and um just the history you provided us i really enjoyed it because it gave me and showed me where it was before the 60s you know when i was born in the early 60s so i remember those times afterwards right so um just thank you for that so really great enjoyed it. Great, that's great to hear, Noel. Thank you um, for your addition. I also know that um, the Pyrenees Hotel where my dad lived, there's this bright neon sign, Adam and Eve. Um, <laughs> <I remember laughs> shining. It, <well>. <laughs> it probably was shining into the windows of the boarding house uh, while they lived there. So I always thought that was quite funny, the location of that sign. Um, yeah, but yeah actually, that's, that's, actually where the Basque Hotel is located, as kids, we'd sneak down to Broadway to take a peek. You know, so uh -huh. <laughs> don't tell, don't tell my dad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah, and definitely, if if um, I had heard it maybe a little bit more, um, since only my dad spoke Basque, uh, I only heard it occasionally when he got together with his brothers and sisters. Um, mm -hmm. But definitely, we heard it a lot when we went to um the restaurants and the boarding houses to to eat because i mean it was everywhere it we we didn't realize like you said we didn't know um how much culture was there how much culture we were experiencing because that was our own personal experience and we thought it was normal but it was actually very unique yeah, yeah no i mean I, and i remember back to the times you talked about the building of the bass cultural center and I'll tell you, during those times, it wasn't, you know, um, those meetings were not always easy meetings, right? There was a lot, of, there was a good amount of people that were against building the Basque Cultural Center, but there right. were many more that, that were for it and willing to take that chance. And the families that donated, the, but not only the money, their time into building the Basque Cultural Center, it, it was incredible. You know, every day you'd see people there after work, on weekends just to get that the home built, right? The school that you built. And it was truly, you know, talk about a community and an extended family coming together to get something done. It was, uh, it shows you just how strong, you know, committed the Basque are to their culture, so. Right, yeah. And I've been Great. enough to see, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely uh, somewhat controversial, and you had those yeah. those naysayers. But uh, that's that's typical also with Basque people. There's always going to be some controversy and some people who are going to be against the idea. They're we all have our own for our their own stubbornness. Yep, for sure. Anyway, thank you, thank you, Nancy. You're welcome. I enjoyed talking about it. But it's it's part of my personal history as well and I'm happy to share that history with other people did anybody else have a question or uh, want to know more about something that we talked about here today
Okay. Well, maybe we're we're done. Yeah, it sounds like we're wrapping up then. Um, well, a biggest get a class go to everybody who joined. Uh, I we have just a couple minutes, so um, I'll just do a couple more shameless plugs for what we have coming up. Since I already have you all hooked, and you have to listen to me. Um, so if you like this type of presentation, um, it's great to put on even as you're making dinner, or whatever, and listen in and or uh, whatever your case is. Uh, we have some more planned. Our next one will be August 13th, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. So if you're in California, a little time change. Uh, and that will be with Philippe, and I dare not say his last name because I know I can't do it right, but he is the president of NABO, which is the North American Bass Organizations. Um, and he will be uh, explaining what that organization is and what its function is and what it does and how it can serve you and your community. Um, it's a little bit of an enigma out there. It's there, but not everybody really knows what its function is. And it's a really cool organization with a lot of resources. So that's our very next one that's coming up. It's free. You just register just like for this one um, and join us, grab your your wine or whatever um, and learn something new. And then the next one that we have after that is called Chalk Talk, which is a bit of a story in itself because for uh, over a year now, we've been trying to host an event about chocolatey wine here in Boise because who doesn't want an event about wine and learning about Basque wine? And for the life of us, we've had to delay it twice now already because of um, COVID and all the things. And so we said, you know what, we're going to do it anyways, even if it's smaller. So we're going to have Dr. Carrie Lush, who is actually an expert. She has a PhD in chocolate wines, and she knows everything there is to know about them. And she's going to give a presentation, not the full thing, like our big, you know, in-person event, but a preview and, um, and enjoy some chocolate wine while we're having our uh, presentation. And you can learn about what makes it so unique and so delicious. And it is actually a really fascinating kind of local product from the Basque country. Um, and so that is all available online and on our uh, website uh, and through Facebook, you know, just like you came into this one. Also, I'll mention, I see a couple people who are joining um, kind of at the end of our presentation for those of who just joined. I'm gonna take a wild guess that there was probably a time zone mix up. And so they're coming um, at 6 p.m. California time. Uh, and not 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Yeah, I was afraid that might happen to a, a couple of people. Uh, I tried to make it, you know, super obvious, but my apologies. Um, so if you missed the presentation, fear not, I've got you covered. If you still want to see it or if you want to watch it again, I've recorded the entire thing and I make it available on YouTube and on our website in about a week. So um, keep your eyes open in a few days and this will be uh, archived and recorded and you can still check it out even if you're joining us late or if you missed it. So um, that will be there for you guys just in case. And then, um, yeah, if you have any questions for us about the Basque Museum, go ahead and pop it in the chat or unmute yourself. We'd love to answer them. And like we said, this uh, exhibit just opened. So there's always more to find out. Like this is really the tip of the iceberg about um, you know, all these things Nancy's been talking about and we have an exhibit, the exhibit hopefully can go to California as well. So, um, yeah, just, just, I could, oh, I mean, more. I'd like to just, uh, briefly mention my book. Uh, it's been out for quite a while now. The, the second edition came out in 2006, Travel Guide to Basque America, but there's a lot of history in there. Um, some of the, the, you know, the restaurants may have closed and so on, but the history of the different Basque communities is in there for those of you who might be interested in reading more about it. I interviewed uh, over 500 people in order to write that book. And so there's uh, pretty much every well-known Basque community in the American West uh, is mentioned in there and some of the prominent families in each community. So I'd like to encourage people to buy it if they haven't uh, seen it yet. Travel Guide to Basque America. I got a question. Why is the museum closed on Sundays? And it's because we too must have a day off <laughs> once in a while. It's also closed on Mondays. So as a heads up, but we are open on Saturday. But 
Um, yeah. <laughs> Can't work every right. day. Yeah. And then um, I should also, I'll, I'll do my own plug, uh, euskalcaseta.com. Um, it's a website that I run and talks about news about the Basque community in the United States. So throw my own plug in there. Might as well. That's, I just want to say thank you for everybody who did join us though. Um, California gets a big shout out today because I don't think a single person joins from Idaho. <laughs> but we have a huge amount of people who are joining us from out of the state. And we just love that. It's like, it's really a joy for us to be able to bring this to people outside of our, you know, local area and share this. And so thank you everyone who took some time to log on and do this. Um, if there, if there isn't much else, I think I can wrap it up um getting some nice shout outs about your book uh in the chat here it's everyone saying check mm -hmm. it out um we absolutely love it we hope we get to see you all in high Aldi next year fingers crossed and uh we're here for you guys so with that i think i will just say a Costco and we'll go ahead and turn this off so everyone have a wonderful evening thank you nancy we appreciate everything you do we absolutely Thanks. love it that you're welcome. I was very happy to see all these people here today. Awesome. Great, everyone. Okay, well, everyone have a great night and I hope to see you at our next presentation.